Okay. Over, do you want to shut the door? Absolutely. Um, I'm going to wait till the end of class to go over some things because I want to make sure that it's here. But I realize in the syllabus I said to bring a resume. So then no one did that, right? Two resumes. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. no. Good, that's good. Oh, good. Good. Break. I'm so happy that, that, no, I'm so happy that no one looked at the syllabus, including myself. <laughs> I just have to make sure because I'm like, ah, for some reason I, I thought that was the last class, which it should be. So just to make sure we. Oh, okay. No, no Molly. Molly. She... Molly's not going to be here. Okay. So whenever you're ready. You can go. Please, again, no one do the don't do the critique while I'll be speaking. We all give him our full attention. It's just us. It's just us. All right. Whenever you're ready. All right. So um, I'm sure most of you, at the end of a long day, you know, you like to go back home, kick up your feet, relax, and uh, maybe tune into your favorite show. There's uh, Netflix, Hulu. How do you like? Mm -hmm. yeah, right. Enjoy that. Good. Relaxing. <laughs> so, um, if you're like me, though, you know, you do appreciate a good political drama, right? House of Cards out there, Veep, The West Wing, if you really want to fall asleep. Really <laughs> but that's your thing, then. That's your thing. But, um, so there's all these shows out there, right? But they all have, well, more than one thing in common, but obviously one really important thing. Keep going. Oh, it's fine. So they all have one thing in common, obviously, though, right? And that is that they're, they tend to be fast-paced. And to do that, they, they actually tend to sacrifice showing the actual legislative process and the actual process of like drafting bills, how it passes in uh, whatever form of government they have. And I think that's a very important part that the viewer should watch, but they obviously can't because Let's face it, it's boring. Nobody would tune in, they wouldn't make money, and they would not be on air, probably. So, tonight, what I want to do for you, because I think it's important that we all in here as attorneys learn the whole process of uh, how a bill is written, and how it actually, like how the language can affect um, different people, different areas, different, you know, what, different everything, pretty much, because they cover everything. So um, what I want to do for you guys tonight is to actually give you a few tips on what to look for when you are, if you end up going into this area or just in uh, any legal profession at all, you know, this can all, all these tips tonight can help you. So obviously, like I said, the shows tend to cut this out because they're boring and I don't want to bore you guys. So I'm not going to do that tonight, all right? You're all interested. <laughs> we want to hear more. So what I'm going to do for you tonight is I'm going to condense all of that into what I like to call my do's and don'ts of legislative drafting, and I'm going to do it in a little BuzzFeed style, because BuzzFeed is fun, right? So I'm going to start out with uh, tip one, and that is brevity. So all of these tips, before I really do begin, I got from uh, the style book, the Rhode Island State style book for legislative drafting. And what the style book does is it gives you tips on basically what you should do when you're drafting a bill, how it should uh, be worded, you know, basic, basic writing skills that you should know. So, to start out, the most important tip is brevity. And that's the style book's fancy way of pretty much saying, shut up and be simple. <laughs> so, brevity is the basic tip that you really should know. You want to be, you want to keep um, everything that you're actually saying in your bill simple and to the point. They want you to limit uh, the style book called it legalese. Obviously, that's their own words, not mine. Um, they want you to limit legalese and pretty much, you know, state whatever it is that you mean and what the point is of the bill to the actual reader. Because not everybody reading these bills is going to be an attorney. Not everybody's going to understand. So you have to be clear in what you're saying. So if you do end up uh, writing a bill ever, I don't recommend it, but if you ever do do it, you know, you want to remember this one line, shut up. <laughs> it's simple. So, going on to uh, tip number two, and this one's going to be pretty obvious from the title, so it's going to be a little quick. We'll get a little harder. Don't worry. Um, so this is obviously the short type. They want you to put in a short title. So, when you're actually... Uh, you know, drafting a bill, you want to make sure that everything you do pretty much is stated in the title. You want to make sure that there's like a short description of what it is 
um, where it helps to like basically once the bill is passed, it helps to put it in the general laws. So they want you to keep it short, simple, to the point, all that good stuff. Um, and it basically follows the previous tip of brevity, keeping it simple. So those two go hand in hand. Now the third tip I have for you tonight is gender. This is very important still, but it's not, it's, it's not so much of an issue today because of the changing times. But um, every statute should basically be gender neutral. You shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't basically put like, you know, personal gender specific pronouns of like his, him, her, all that good stuff. Uh, you want to keep it like uh, to, to the point general to apply to everybody or people like that you can reasonably foresee. So there is one exception to this rule though. So the only case where you may be able to use a gender specific pronoun is if you have a statute that's dealing with a certain gender's, you know, uh, situation, I guess you could say. So if you have like a statute dealing with ovarian cancer or prostate cancer, obviously that's going to be specific to one gender. So that's the only exception. Next tip, most important, commas. You want to make sure that when you have um, commas, or like when you're actually drafting a bill, you want to make sure that comma placement is in the right spot. Most important rule, nobody seems to follow it ever. <clears throat> and it's important because I can't give you like a specific um, example of this. It's really kind of case by, actually, I do have one, but like it's not, I don't have any form because it's boring. So you want to kind of keep it specific to like um, the bill and like com placing the commas where they are needed or not placing them where they're not needed. It's very hard to do, obviously. Um, a lot of the, these mistakes are, you know, basic, like people just didn't look at the bill or they just didn't like, you know, kind of read it and it ends up screwing up the whole bill. So an example of that, um, two weeks ago, I would say, in my office, we had a bill come in. It was about reverse mortgages and Basically what happened was they worded the bill wrong in the beginning, like they just had word, they had like or when they meant of, like, I mean these guys just couldn't spell in general, I don't know how they got elected to senators, but um, it ended up being a mess and it creates a mess for everybody else, so comma placement is very important. Next tip, we're going to get into the don'ts, and I stress to you guys, do not do any of this, any of this ever. Because I swear somebody somewhere will make a voodoo doll of you and curse you. <laughs> so you want to keep these don'ts out of your bill. Starting with number one. And or. Never under any circumstance do you ever want to use and or in a bill. Ever. I want to repeat it right now. Never use that. Never use that. Thank you. Yeah. Jeez, what is this, a dead crowd today? <laughs> All right. So you never want to use and or. And the reason for that being, because an idiot like me would obviously read a statute with and slash or, and I would apply the wrong one to the wrong situation. <clears throat> and, you know, once you do that, then I'll have like a different interpretation in my own head as opposed to what the bill actually means. And I can screw up my client if I'm an attorney, and it just gets messy from there. So what you want to do, whenever you feel compelled to have an and or in a sentence, you want to always put an or, because the and would mean the subject, that you're including the subject, and um, everything that goes after it, whereas an or is the subject, and maybe one or more of everything that follows. Get it? Good. Awesome. So you won't do that. Next, and the final most important tip, never do this ever add etc in a statute, ever. <laughs> now, this one tends to happen every once in a while, and obviously, you know, as attorneys, I, I know you guys have probably seen this at some point or another, attorneys will argue anything. So if you add etc into a bill, it turns ugly. And that actually happened last week. So we got a motor vehicle statute that came in and it basically said, for motor vehicles, it defined them as 
automobiles, motorcycles, boats. What I like to think of is anything reasonably found in an insur insurance policy, right? Now, if you had a lawyer that was the devil, he would obviously argue anything else. Maybe if somebody built something in their garage and they wanted it to be covered, he could do that. So you never want to put in an et cetera because it can get ugly. So these have basically been my tips tonight. Um, I hope you guys learned something, maybe, I don't know. But uh, they're very important. Like I said, they can help you in your career later on, even if you don't go into the whole legislative drafting process. But it's important to know. Any questions? Yeah, no? sure. So with the et cetera part, um, yeah. I mean, are there ever times where you want to leave something a little bit open to interpretation um, and let like, the judiciary decide, or are there, is, the st is the goal always to literally define everything that's covered, everything that isn't covered, and leave absolutely no ambiguity? You do want it. You never want to leave any ambiguity. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, you want to like, always kind of cut out what, you, what it is that you want to define, what it is that you want to cover or you know, explain to people. And you never want to leave anything to chance, is how it was explained to me, at least. So, anyone else? So did you learn these tips just throughout, throughout the summer? Did someone tell you them, or did you actually... Uh... Yeah, so like I learned them throughout the summer, I was told, and then like I actually got a copy of the style book, and I read it, and it made sense. And it wasn't as funny as your presentation, I'm assuming. <laughs> actually really boring, too. <laughs> <laughs> anyone else? Great job. Awesome. Nice. Excellent. <laughs> Good job. So, will we grab one of those self critiques? All right. Um, and if you feel like you can't really do it justice right now because you're just like adrenaline pumping, you can also just do it at home and bring it back. Okay. Week. I don't. And everyone else is doing it anonymously. And maybe Obi go on that side. Do you get to watch your video oh, when you do yeah. self critique? Yeah. Well, that is, so I haven't actually done this in the past. If you'd prefer to watch it first, which would make sense, I'm happy to let you do it. I feel like most people can do an initial critique, which is pretty accurate. I think this will take a week to get oh, okay. going. That's the only problem. I can give it to you. So I used to always find that if you watch yourself on video, you, you, like, you see things you didn't realize. I think you would. And if, to the extent you want to wait, I'm happy to try to get you to oh. faster. I just, they're not that quick with the turnaround. I'm sorry. Oh, crap.
Perfect time. You know what I'm talking about, do you? Oh, just like you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, um, So with the peer evaluations, I will scan them all in and send them to. No, but I mean, no. right now, send them to me. Okay. Send them to me. I'll collect. Uh, in person. Yeah, I didn't know we got to the What's that? I didn't know you got to the five a.m. You don't have to. It's whatever you want. Oh, yeah, like You can say five a.m. You don't want to. You can put it in the computer. Thank you. Out of my friend. So Jesse, after we look, Stephanie's going to go next and then Don, but just familiar, this is the same rubric that I sent you all in the packet, but just sort of look at it quickly so that when you're listening to Stephanie and Don, you're sort of aware of the things they're going to be critiquing them on, but don't do the critique while you're, while they're in the middle of the presentation. Okay. We'll wait and give everyone, you know, five to ten minutes after, and take your time. Oh, but are you still working? No, no, no. Because no, no. you can also finish it after. Yeah. Okay. Good to go? You're good to go. All right. So, how a bill becomes law. I want you to look at this first slide over here. It's because it's beautiful. But no, but really, I want you to look at this part right here. How a bill becomes law. Because really, what I could have wrote in that place was how an idea becomes law. Because I like to look at a bill as an idea. It's, it's an idea that we want to uh, uh, bring into our government, into our society. So I want you to remember that as I'm going on today with this presentation, that a bill can equal an idea. But before we move on into everything, I just want to say this is a presentation for you guys. This is for you. And the reason why I say it's for you is there's two reasons. The first has to do with the topic, it's a topic of utmost importance. <coughs> it affects us all. And the second has to do with, no matter who you are, unless you are intimately involved with the workings of government and the legislator in general, you can always learn something from this. So I think everybody in this room can learn something from this presentation and something that's going to be useful. So. Now you might be thinking, why should I care? Why do I care why, how a bill becomes law? It becomes law, I follow the law, so why should I care? Well, a show of hands, who here feels like they understand how a bill becomes law, to the details? Federal or state? State. Uh, it could be even general. Kind of, right. Not exactly on point, right? Now, 
a second showing of hands. Who here has a political opinion on something that they really feel passionately about? Yeah, we all do. I, and I was the same way. When I came into my externship, I had all these political opinions and political ideas in my head, but I didn't know exactly how all this worked, how all government works. So then I thought to myself, how could I effectively advocate for something that I do feel so passionately about if I don't understand how it works? So this is a necessary understanding for all of us. And I, again, I think that we all can learn from this. So let's look at this in a little more detail. So we have our bill, that's our idea, and we put it into text, okay? So what's the next step? What do we, where do we go from there? How do we make our idea a law? First we need a sponsor. So for our purposes, we're going to look at a bill from the House of Representatives, just because it's cool and it has the coolest workers over there. <laughs> but, no, we'll look at it from the House of Representatives' uh, point of view. So we need a sponsor. Who's our sponsor going to be? The sponsor should be somebody who, whose uh, political ideals align with what our political ideals in our bill are. The sponsor is going to be somebody who's going to advocate for your bill in the House of Representatives, and in fact in both chambers. But So the sponsor's responsibility is going to be to get co-sponsors, and then more importantly, it's going to introduce the bill to the House floor. Okay. So once the sponsor introduces the bill to the House floor, we go on to the next step, which is committees. So we have the Speaker of the House in the House of Representatives. He leads the House of Representatives. He's going to direct into what we call committees. Now committees are the representatives with the best knowledge in specific areas. There are uh, the elite in certain areas. So in uh, the House committees, we have 11 House committees, and just to give you a few examples, there are House Finance, uh, House Committee on Health, uh, Education and Welfare, House Judiciary. So all these committees, they have specific focuses, and the people in there, especially the chairperson, has some sort of, I guess you could call it elite knowledge in that specific area. So the speaker will direct it to the appropriate committee, and our elite representatives within those committees will hear the bill and look at it into uh, more detail. They'll hear testimony and uh, the way the pros and cons, and then ultimately they're going to vote. And when they vote in committee, they're either going to vote to recommend passage of the bill, to hold the bill for further study, which basically translates to us that the bill is complex for whatever reason, and they're not confident with either denying it or sending it forward. So they're going to hold on to it. Or they can reject the bill. So let's assume for our purposes that the bill gets recommended for passage. So we go on to our next phase here, which is we go to the House floor, the beautiful building, uh, the beautiful room that Susie saw today. Uh, extremely hot, okay? But it's a very interesting process from this point on. So once the bill comes out of committee, it goes to uh, the House floor and the speaker actually is in a unique position where he sets the calendar for each session. So, theoretically, if the Speaker of the House didn't like the particular bill, he could post keep postponing it and maybe indefinitely postpone it and kill it. Uh, but, again, for our purposes, let's continue on. So what's going to happen on the floor? You have these 75 uh, men and women in this hot room you wouldn't think that you would have that much debate, considering how hot it was in that room. But it's unbelievable at times what they argue over. But so that's what happens. We end up getting debate over over the bills. So one representative will say, signal that they want to speak and they want to uh, weigh the pros or the cons either way. And after the debate is over, the speaker will call for a vote. Now. A majority vote in favor of the bill will mean that it passes. So, assuming that it does pass, we go on to this next step, which is transmittal to the Senate. So now we all remember in grade school we have two chambers in government. We have the House of Representatives, which is the cool uh, part of the legislature, and then we have this, uh, the Senate. 
So what's going to happen is our House bill, after it's passed the House of Representatives, is going to be transmitted to the other chamber, okay, so they can uh, weigh in. So from here, it's going to go through the same process. Our experts, now we have Senate experts in specific areas, and they're going to hear about our bill, and they're going to decide whether or not it's a good fit for the state. After that, if it does come out, we go again to the floor. More debate in a hot floor. If it comes out of there, then we have Senate transmittal to the governor. Okay, And that is where we begin our journey to, or begin the endings to our journey for it to become law. So from here, the governor can do a couple things. She has three options when uh, the bill comes across her desk. She can either sign the bill, and that will make it law. She can veto the bill, like we learned back in the day, send it back, and then uh, the uh, General Assembly can override the veto. Or she can do something which, re which is really interesting, and which actually happens a lot, is make the bill effective without her signature. And how that's done is basically she, I hesitate to use the word neglect, but she doesn't touch the bill. And uh, after six days of it being transmitted from the chamber, it becomes law. So, I'll tell you uh, an interesting story. You, you may have figured out that I really like this topic. It may not be the most interesting. And when I came into my externship, like I uh, implied before, I didn't really know all of that much about it. But I quickly learned a lot about it because I was quickly given a lot of assignments that dealt with bill tracking. And I was immersed in this really quickly. So I think the best way to understand this is through practice. Practice makes perfect. So I think that's going to help you guys out too. I think practice makes perfect. So I'd like to get a volunteer. Maybe we can go through a mock bill. Anybody want to volunteer? Don. I'll go with Obi. Go with Obi. <laughs> no, Obi's no, too no. committed. All right, fine. <laughs> fine, okay, I'll do it. Committed. Um, okay, so here's what we're going to do. Remember, we have our two chambers. Which bill do you want to, uh, which chamber do you want to focus on? The, the House of the Senate. people are. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, no, Senate is fine. Okay. Do I have to go with any? No, no, you're fine. Oh. Oh, I thought you wanted me to say it. No, no, no. I'm rolling in this presentation. Uh, so, a Senate bill. So, Senate bills in uh, the Rhode Island legislature start with five, uh, I'm sorry, um, one. Okay? Whereas in the House of Representatives, they start with 5,000. So, pick a number. One. One. Okay. So, we have Don's bill number one. And what is your bill on? Um, What's your idea? A bill to pass a measure for air conditioning. <laughs> air conditioning. I like that. All right, so we'll put Don's AC bill. All right, so we're in the Senate. So what's our first step? We have our bill. Here it is. What's our first step? Um, we need a sponsor. We need a sponsor. Who's going to be our sponsor? Someone who sweats a lot. Someone who sweats a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right, good. So we have our sponsor. And the sponsor does what? He rounds up other co-sponsors. Co-sponsors, and then ultimately what's the most important thing that the sponsor is going to do for Introduce. him? Introduce. Introduce it. All right. <coughs> From there, where does it go? It's going to go to the committee. Right. The relevant committee. And there could be several of those, right? Yeah, and it's going to be, in this case, it'll be the um, Senate president who's going to decide which is the uh, most relevant. So then from here, it goes where? If it comes out of the committee? If it, if it gets voted out. Right. It goes to the floor? Which? The Senate floor. Perfect. And after here? Um... It gets debated. Right. And then it goes to vote. Right. And after the vote? Uh, it's going to go to the governor. No. Remember, we have two houses. Oh, oh crap. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, uh, it's going to go to the house. Yeah. To the house. 
and our, our crisscross of the bill begins. So our Senate bill is now going to be heard by the House. So you're saying Senate bill number one, Don's AC bill, is going to go to the House of Representatives. So once it gets transmitted to the House of Representatives, then where does it go? To committee. Committee. And it comes out of committee? Um, floor? Right. Debate and vote. And then after that? Governor. There, then it goes to the governor. Now, what's really cool about this, and this is actually where I want to go next, is that all of that kind of makes sense, even though it crisscrosses everywhere. You can follow the pattern, but there are also strategies involved in, um, in how a bill becomes law. The first one I want to talk about is duplicates. So Don's AC bill, number one, can also, there can also be a, we can call it Don's AC bill of 5001, and that's going to be the House version, okay? And sometimes what will happen is the Senate will pass the bill and it will go all the way to the governor, and the governor will sign it. But the House version will still be stuck in a committee somewhere or hasn't gotten to the floor, whatever the reason is. But they will still push it. And now when I was in my externship, I asked my supervisor, I said, well, what's the point of that? You already have that same idea of becoming law, so why do you need to continue with it? And he said, well, there's two reasons. The first has to do with long-standing practice in the state of Rhode Island, which that's just what they, they do. They pass both of them. And the second, more relevant, has to do with the... Uh, so Don, if he's the sponsor of this bill, he's going to get credit for it becoming law. Whereas the House sponsor, who put just as much effort as Don, won't get any credit because his version didn't become law. So that's one interesting way of... Uh, uh, the, the uh, different chambers uh, play games. Another one is the transmittal game. So we have down here the governor transmitted. Right. Now over here the House of Representatives had the option to transmit the uh, bill to the governor. Okay, they're not obligated to. And by the same token, if a House bill came to the Senate, the Senate would have the option and not the obligation to transmit the bill uh, to the governor. So there's a little bit of gamesmanship that goes on where they trade bills. They say, well, we'll pass, we'll transmit your Senate bill if you'll transmit our House bill. So there's a little bit more that's involved rather than uh, just this sort of zigzag that goes on. So I want to leave you with one thing. It's a reminder. Just remember, a bill is an idea. We all have ideas in our head. Now that we know how we can turn our ideas into law, we can use our ideas to effect change where we see most fit. And that's why this is important. Thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll take them now. Don. Uh, uh, I, first of all, I thought it was interesting that you said if the governor doesn't sign it, it becomes law. Because right. if I'm not mistaken, at the federal level, they have like what's called, a, isn't it like the pocket veto where if they don't do anything, it's automatically not law. Whereas in Rhode Island, it seems like if they don't do anything, it's, it becomes law. Right. That's the way it is in, yeah. in Rhode Island. Right. In but the pocket view, I haven't heard in a while, but I think that's right. <laughs> yeah. In Rhode Island, we do it backwards. <laughs> <laughs> no surprise there. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. But <laughs> Anybody else have a question? And it, has there been, with the new governor, more of that style of not signing? Only I, signing stuff that she feels very strongly about? Or has it I wouldn't, I mean, I'm, I don't think I'm in a position to say whether or not there's more or less, but there definitely, especially in our state we have, and in other states too, we have what's called solemn, solemnization of marriages, which basically says that the, um, the General Assembly can vote to give you the power to uh, uh, solemn, solemn, uh, solemnize someone in marriage. <laughs> So, to do what? I'm sorry. To to officiate the. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. So it's a little bit of a tongue twister, but okay. we get through it. Um, so a lot of that happens, and the governor doesn't have to sign it, for, so she just lets it go. So there are a lot. When you look at them, there are a lot that she just kind of lets go and lets uh, become effective without her signature. But you're right. 
those that she does strongly care about, she will sign. But a lot of the stuff she doesn't, you think, is probably just minor, it's not worth her... Right, and there are some other bills, too, that, you know, I wouldn't call them minor that she's led. I was going to say, I assume that's where she wants to support something, but doesn't want to have the political backlash exactly. of signing it. Right. So, that would be my tactic. Well, let's do, I mean, like, if the Senate and the House, like, both want to pass a bill on something, and, like, they pass different versions, like, as I think happens sometimes, mm -hmm. right, but, and they're, like, kind of close, can't they have one of those, like, joint committees or something where they, like, work out the differences and, like, come to a hybrid solution to... Do they ever do that? Yeah. Well, I think a lot of that happens in that sort of gamesmanship with uh, where they play that transmittal game. Oh, okay. yeah. And they, they, through the bargaining, they end up coming with uh, the bill that fits both of their needs through, uh, based on the big picture, I guess you would say. So, But it's different. You're right, because on the federal level, they do have a, a, a committee that's made up of both, of both senators and representatives that take the two different bills and create one right. for the whole to send to the um, uh, president. Anybody else for a question? Obi? No, I'm good. I keep got mine. All right. Thank you so much. you're doing a peer critique, just put the put Stefano's name on it, not your name. And Stefano, if you want to get a self critique in the front, you can do it now or later. Oh. Start it now and finish it later.
<laughs> I'm just laughing because it's like, you're like, it's so hot. Someone comes to wait until. I started with that because that's the way one of the TED Talks starts. Do you know what I really liked it was um, the doctor? What, of the stakes one? Yeah. That one was like really good. Well, I think I see how it was going I watched one on sociopaths. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's good. It's pretty good. He had this like really cool, like, where he'd be describing something and then the artist would like draw things behind him, like of what he was describing, and I was like, wow, oh. <laughs> like I want that. <laughs> oh, you mean like unrelated, like one of those um, visual? Yeah, it was like, it'd be just like this, yeah. but like he'd be describing something and then there'd be like a sketch that would like. There, that's draw like a really hot this. thing in conferences right now. It was like, like all well, the national conferences I've been to in the past two years, there's someone doing a visual, which makes sense. While someone's doing a presentation, there's someone like doing like the big words or the concept, just like a, an image. Well, like and they're, they're, they're artists; they get paid a lot of money. It's actually for like my topic, though. It's like I went and looked up all like the mental health, like mental illness, like things. Because oh, no, I'm like, how are they doing that? So mm -hmm. I've got some ideas. Started, you're still working on yours, just stop for now and continue later. There's no rush to do it. Just sit at the classroom and take it home. So where's the little clicker thing? Uh, up there. Uh, it's right on the side. Yeah, don't let me be in that one. Yeah, that is your job. Yeah, what do I yeah. Is that yourself? Put it on the table. No, is it what? Here. No. Yeah. Well, just, just put it on the table. Click this thing. Yeah, I'll take it all. Put it in yeah. your bag. Yeah. 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 Do it once you know what it's going to be. I remember that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
or if they're trying to get a job, right? When you probably, you know, low level of skills, they're probably defender clients, you know, they're indigent people. Try going to get a, you know, regular run of the mill service job at a McDonald's or something and start wanting about all the days you're going to need off. And they're probably not going to want to give you that job. And even if you did tell them that and they were willing to be amenable, you might say, why do you need those days off? And now you're going to be stuck between the rock and the hard place of either A, telling them the truth, oh, I got charged with larceny. And the person's going to think, geez, am I going to have to watch my cash registers? Am I going to hire this person? So then you're not going to get the job to get the money that you need to pay the restitution. Or, alternatively, you start off on a bad foot by lying to a, a new employer. Right? So this is a bad situation to be in. Uh, and that's just one crime. There are a lot of other crimes where, you know, similarly, whatever you, know, you need to do, whether it's taking some counseling classes, you're going to have constant court appointments. You're going to need to keep coming back. You might be driving on a suspended license. The problem usually has to do with money. You don't have money to get your license restored, so you don't have money to satisfy the thing. You don't have money to, once you don't have a car, you can't get a job. It's, it's a vicious cycle. And, um, and it's very difficult. So what does this mean? Well, this means, first of all, that people are constantly coming back to court. And what you get is this, right? These are pictures of courthouses all across the nation, all right? These people right here are, are, are standing out in, like, I think it's Michigan, and it's negative five degrees outside. Uh, and they're all, they all got there early, and they're lined up around the block because they know it's like first come, first serve. Some courses, it's not even first come, first courthouses like New London isn't first come, first serve. It's whenever the hell they decide to call you. But, like, these people are lined up, and these are, this is Alabama, I forget where this, this one's actually Massachusetts, I think, and I forget where this one is. But it's a common scene. People are just coming back all the time. And a lot of the times, finally when you get to this breaking point where the prosecutors are like, no more, we're not running a collection agency, uh, they'll say like, well, we got an offer for you. You need time to pay. Well, guess what? We'll give you time to pay. We'll give you like two years. You'll be on probation for two years. And one of the conditions of your probation will be repaying this debt over time. The problem is, though, if you're dealing with indigent people who live in low-income neighborhoods, if they're on probation, they may have underlying mental health issues, they may have underlying addiction issues. You know in your heart that like, as much as you're going to hope they clean everything up, there's a good chance they're going to get hit with a new arrest. And if they get hit with a new arrest, that's a violation of probation, and that could mean jail. In fact, in all times it does, if, if the offense is serious enough. So, so it's really like a vicious cycle, right? And that's why you have this, right? This is the number of incarcerated Americans uh, per capita and ever since basically 1970, 1980, and really in the 90s, you just see this go off the charts, right? Is that, you know, there's more income inequality, there's more people stuck in a vicious cycle of poverty, uh, which leads them to be unemployable, which leads them to not be able to do things. They can't get a job, so they turn to crime. And we've criminalized everything, and everyone always wants to be tough on crime. And so, you know, basically what you get is this exponential growth in the number of incarcerated persons. That's why uh, our own Professor Savage here at Roger Williams University uh, held an entire seminar this past semester all about mass incarceration. It's a big problem. Uh, and so I would analogize the, the criminal justice system in this country all across the nation uh, to something like the Hotel California if you're an indigent person. Essentially, you could check out any time you like, but you can never seemingly leave. Uh, the good news, though, is that there is some progress, that people have said to themselves, there has to be a better way, and in fact, uh, certain places have tried it. Now, unfortunately, New London, one of them, and so essentially, I guess I should have probably started off by saying this, but this is the, top, the essential topic of this presentation, uh, beyond just presenting this problem to you, is to also present a solution, and it happens not to be in New London, but I was trying to think of a presentation, what could be one thing that I would do to change the atmosphere in which I work, and you know, that's kind of a bold thing to say, because I've only been there for a month. I don't know the criminal justice system, you know, the way that all the people around me do, but I have talked to a lot of other attorneys, and they're excited about this phenomenon that seems to be in place in certain courthouses, one of which actually is in Connecticut, Hartford. There's another burgeoning one in Waterbury and Stanford, Connecticut, uh, but they're called uh, community courts. Um, and basically what they do is they offer people the opportunity to get the charges against them nollied, which is to say thrown out, but only after completing a certain amount of community service. Now, in cases, it basically the sentence is, is basically focused on rehabilitation. Even if you're a repeat offender, as long as the crime is minor, you're going to be able to uh, qualify for a community court. Uh, so, and, and the, 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 um, the sentence, if you will, if you want to call it a sentence, 
always seems to sort of um, basically attempt to rehabilitate the person in some way. So for instance, another crime that commonly comes before community courts is prostitution. So in those cases, yes, there may be a community service component, but perhaps the more important component uh, will include uh, some sort of psychological counseling uh, and, um, you know, oftentimes a psychological assessment. A lot of times people are abused as kids, and that's why they sort of turn to this activity. Uh, a lot of times they have underlying drug problems, and so they attempt to find out what's driving the person to literally sell their body for money, for drugs, or for whatever it might be. And they try to address that and, and come to some sort of uh, solution that will further the person's uh, advancement in society, that will help them get reintegrated into society, because they recognize that when you're incarcerated, you're taken out of society. And the more and more times you're incarcerated, and the more, you know, the longer and longer of period of time you're incarcerated, you start to forget how to function in the real world. And moreover, your reintegration into the real world and the regular world that you and I all know becomes that much harder. Um, so another one like might be the larceny. And so, for instance, a lot of these courts are endowed with grants that are usually some sort of combination of public, private money, um, fine money that might be paid by criminal defendants in other cases and stuff. And what those what that all goes to is building a program. So for instance, if you shoplifted a hundred dollars worth of groceries from the grocery store and you can't come up with the money, well, they'll have you do 10 days of community, or what is it? I think they usually, it's like, basically it's usually based on like a $5 or $6 per hour rate or something like that. But like, you'll do a certain number of hours of community service, you schedule it when it's convenient for you, you know, when you're not having childcare issues, when you're not having a part-time job or whatever it is, you schedule the blogger time all right, I'm going to come these six dates, and you can schedule it out, and when you do it, it's done. The case is gone. You're not on probation, you're not on some kind of suspended sentence where if you screw up again, you're going to be facing a, a lengthy prison term. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you essentially, you do it, it's done, the case is now, and it is off. You're not going to have any record that's going to make you more employable, it's going to help you reintegrate into society that much more, and it's going to help you avoid getting caught up in that vicious cycle we talked about earlier. Um, now, uh, as I extol the benefits of this program, uh, I mean, that's not just me speaking from a sort of public defender person's perspective, because obviously you'd say to yourself, the public defenders are always going to favor more lenient treatment of indigent clients, because it's their clients, that's who they represent. But the fact is, is that uh, the Center for Court Innovation, which is a non-profit, non-partisan organization that has, uh, work, that has studied courthouses all over the United States of America, have found that uh, there are certain, basically, when people go through uh, community courts, the first one was in Manhattan, I believe, uh, and they tried it there, and, it, and then it was like a pilot project that spread outward. Uh, they have found that there are lower rates of recidivism for larceny. Uh, they have found that uh, people, in some cases, learn job skills. So if you're, say, planting uh, flowers for you know a period of time, you might find that you like horticulture and gardening, and then you might get a job landscaping or something like that. So people actually learn some skills along the way, and it invests them into beautifying or helping or you know, basically building relationships within the community in which they reside. Uh, the, one, the community in court in Hartford actually makes it easy for people to do these sentences because what they do is they either find them a placement in the area, like where they live, where they can walk to it, if, and because a lot of people don't have access to reliable transportation, or if they can get to the courthouse, because the courthouse is pretty much on every single city bus line, if they can get to the courthouse, there'll be a big van that takes everybody who's doing the community court sins, and they take them out to the job site, and then they perform their service. So they have a way to get there and back, and they're back in time to get the bus back home, and it's something they can actually do, rather than having to make what are essentially false premises that they'll have more money by a couple of weeks, and then they don't have enough, and then everyone gets mad, and they end up going on probation, and if they mess up again, they're in jail. Uh, so it's, uh, th th I mean, this, this model, I think, is, is really much, much better. And the Center for Court Innovation, again, non-partisan, non-profit, um, just basically wants to make courts more accessible, um, more transparent to people, understandable. Uh, it aims to um, increase efficiency, so you don't have this, right, where people are stuck constantly. Because a lot of these people are just marking time. Like, they're coming back to tell them that they're not done with whatever the hell it is they're supposed to do. Whereas if they can, you know, set out a time, I'm going to do all this service, I'm going to do it in this period of time, I can come to the courthouse on these days, the van will take me and come back. I mean, it's, it's clean, it's cut and dry. They certainly work for it. I mean, 
it's really easy to try to borrow money from somebody just to get satisfy obligation, but this actually gives them a role in literally working off their sentence, uh, and it is far too uh, little utilized. And, and also, too, I should mention, like I said earlier, I said you might think this is a public defender's perspective. So when I was thinking about doing this presentation, earlier today I went and asked a prosecutor, uh, a couple of the prosecutors actually, about uh, what they thought about the community courts. And I expected them to say, oh, it's like lenient treat treatment for these people should be in jail. They're like, no, we wish we had one here in New London. Is that the three of the twelve? You've got three of them. Oh, thanks. Um, so I said, you know, what do you think about that? They're like, oh, we love it. They're like, we hate prosecuting all these rinky-dink cases, but they're like, all we have as tools are either threatening jail, probation, or, you know, or, or, or going to trial, which, you know, that never happens really, but, I mean, essentially, like, I mean, all they, that's all they have. If they had a tool like this, like a community court, where they could either ship them out to a separate courthouse or in other community courts in other parts of the country, they have Saturday morning dockets, um, you know, part, like, maybe just for the morning on Saturday and everyone who's charged with a community court offense just comes in, and it's more like a, not even almost like a court, it's almost like a social work type of a thing, where they work out problems collaboratively and together. Uh, they're like, we wish we had something like that. It would make our docket so much lighter, and it would allow us to focus on the cases that are actually important, rather than these stupid ones that they themselves admit they don't really want to be bothered with, but they can't also just let them go entirely because they'd be really failing in their function. So a lot of people want this, uh, and you know, not every place has it. Uh, you know, It does take collaboration resources. I understand money doesn't grow on trees, but uh, I think there are a lot of ways to do it, so you can add a small surcharge on internet payments for tickets. Connecticut doesn't even have that. They don't, they don't allow you to pay tickets through the internet, which is ridiculous in this day and age. So add a small surcharge and put it towards a fund that would help fund programs like this. But also I would tell you, I think that there are cost savings in and of themselves because the more and more people you have walking through the justice system every day, I mean, it keep well, probably it keeps more public defenders employed, but but I, mean, but I mean, that's a waste of resources too. You have judges, you have court reporters who have to transcribe all the stuff that goes on. I mean, you know, these court dockets could be severely lightened. Jail, you know, the amount of money we spend on jailing people, which of course is astronomical, everybody knows that, that could be lightened. Uh, and I think in general, um, these collaborative solutions are working. Uh, the statistics say they're working. Every attorney I've talked to, prosecutors, public defenders included, all say that they would like to have it, and I think the idea should spread. And I think ultimately, uh, you know, see these people, they look happy. You happy? I'm happy. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, you had said that in these community service programs, they're not on probation. But what would happen if they did screw up while they're? doing this program, do um, they just kind of get stacked up on one another? Yeah, they might have another, well, it depends how serious what they did was, uh, right. if it was just another, like, let's say they got a breach of peace or disorderly conduct because they were drunk in public and started arguing with their girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever. I mean, if it was something like that, they probably would just get another community court case. Right. But I mean, if it was something more serious, um, well, I think, I think the way it's done is that the community court matter is treated as separate, so it's like, all right. I mean, if you go out and uh, you seriously assault somebody, that's not going to be community court. That's, right. that's going to real court. Uh, and you're probably going to get locked up on bail. And so therefore, if you can't make bail, you know, you're not going to be able to do the community service because you're in jail. Mm -hmm. So it would probably just swoop that case over. Right. Um, you know, so, I mean, yeah, it would probably just become part of that docket. I mean, but I mean, you're talking about a period of weeks versus probation can last six months, a year, right. sometimes two years, depends what it is. So. You know, if someone says, I need a long time to pay this fine, or I need a long time to complete this counseling, I don't have access to a car right now, it's being difficult on me, or whatever. The longer they're on probation, the longer that they are literally on thin ice. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a case in Connecticut called Payne v. Robinson, which says that uh, any new arrest can trigger a violation of probation. And that's a separate crime from the underlying offense. So you could get, uh, you know, um, like a disorderly conduct or something, and if your probation officer decides to violate you, then you're violated. So then you face prosecution on the disorderly conduct, you also face a separate charge, which is a violation of probation, and that doesn't need to be proven by a reasonable doubt. Just preponderance. That's which is why any new arrest gives probable, I'm sorry, gives rise to probable cause for violation of probation. So really, like, whenever you're on probation, you don't want to be on probation. You're on thin ice, it's really bad. This avoids that because I, get go, I go to the court for the first time at arraignment, they sit me down with a social worker, 
three weeks from now you complete this community service. When you do it, case is done. Over and in, in three weeks you are out of peril. So. Anyway. I've got one. So this program is this the court system that is initiating this program, or is this the public defenders? Initiating this, like, where is the entry point? Okay, um, so I, I, I once asked uh, my own supervisor, Blank, who really runs this place? Um, and he said the judges, really. He's like, the judges, with the assistance of like court administrators, uh, things like that, they look at docket loads, they try to determine, you know, hey, does this courthouse seem to be bigger, things like that, you know. He's like, but essentially the judges, and um, what usually happens is, is that a group of judges and court administrators will say, hmm, there's this federal grant out there for a, you know, uh, community court project or something, and then they'll, you know, make an application as to why they need it and stuff, and it could get them, you know, more money to have a Saturday morning docket. Or if it's a lot of money, it could be uh, an annex building or something where they have these cases and they put those a couple days a week. Um, you know, in general, you find in court systems, like, there's a lot of resistance to change because people like predictability. And I don't mean um, like the clients, I mean like the lawyers, the judges. I mean, they just like things to stay the way they are. And I mean, there's a lot of inertia. But, um, but at the same time, there are some people who realize, you know, that if you can convince people basically that things will be more efficient, that it's not going to make them less useful or likely to lose their job. Uh, and if you convince them that uh, more money will flow into the courthouse, opening up more positions, things like that. I mean, people just need to know that their own job security and or, you know, usefulness will not be jeopardized, and I think most people are receptive to it. And actually, interestingly enough, there's someone uh, from the Center for Court Innovation at my courthouse right now thinking about trying to start one of these things, so. Uh. Anybody else? This last one. I mean, you kind of touched on it already, but is it just grants that they use for funding or so like yeah funding? like I mean there's there's like I said there's public money there's also private money um, for instance the one in Hartford uh, some wealthy philanthropist or something um, I think he got either I don't know if he died and then left it to him or if he was just old and had a lot of money <laughs> I forget which but I mean he uh, he put out like an endowment which of course you know creates interest on itself things like that which helps pay for staffing and rent if you're into the building or something like that. And so, uh, and then there's also, like I said, there's, I think there are some, in Hartford, I think there are some fees that people pay, like when they pay funds to the court, they have little surcharges on them, things like that, and that goes to fund it. Um, you know, all, all sorts of different things. Uh, like when someone pays like court costs, for instance, you know, a portion of the court costs goes to funding something like this. Um, so, you know, even if their case maybe gets dismissed, they still might owe $15, something like that. So, I mean, yeah, there's, there's lots of ways that, that that happens, but basically it's a it's a combination of public and private funds that you need sort of a critical mass of um, power brokers, judges, lawyers, philanthropists, this, um, probably politicians and stuff, and also the, maybe the grant money to get you started. And if you have those like-minded and um, similarly motivated people uh, in one spot, it tends to happen. And if you don't have that critical mass of individuals, it usually doesn't. You may have touched on this, but like, can you, is this an option for people with like, um, stack charges where like they might be facing losing their license, or they have this as an option? Usually for motor vehicle violations, so I have a list of stuff that's covered, um, usually by these things. Uh, so, breach of peace, uh, petty larceny, prostitution, public drunkenness, criminal trespass, simple possession, i.e. a low amount of drugs, uh, drug paraphernalia. Uh, low degrees of threatening, so i.e. not threatening with a gun, but just like, oh, I'm going to kill you, something like that, you know. Uh, criminal mischief, disorderly conduct, I mean, so, to, like, they call them quality of life offenses, and I think, interestingly enough, I don't know why they use that term um, a lot, but I think it might be, well, at least I have two hypotheses as to what it might be. Uh, hypothesis number one is that, it, you know, if people stop doing these things, they might find their quality of life improves, and number two, when you have these sorts of things in your neighborhood, in your community, public drunkenness, prostitution, criminal trespass, possession of drugs, paraphernalia, um, property destruction, criminal mischief, all that kind of stuff, that detracts from the quality of life that people experience in their communities. And by actually doing this community service work, whatever it might be, whatever projects need to be done, um, you know, you 
sort of address these harms to the community, because that's the ultimate victim in a lot of these crimes, and you sort of address the harm to the community by having people rebuild the community. Um, and so if people have stacked charges, as you say, uh, with motor vehicle stuff, that typically doesn't qualify because I think the concern there is, say, a DUI or something. I mean, that's not something you really work off the community. Like, the real concern there is making sure people don't do that again mm. uh, and things like that. Also take education classes and things. Um, they already do do community service, though. Like, for instance, if you get a fine for a DUI, you get a, or I'm sorry, if you get a... Um, drug charge or, or, or a DUI charge or something like that, a serious one that wouldn't qualify for this, uh, you usually, maybe if you're a first-time offender, you might get a program for that, uh, and you complete classes and do things, but usually there's a fine component, and if you don't have the money for the fine, they will give you community service hours. Mm -hmm. And that's different because, um, you know, it's, uh, it's at your own discretion, and you know, if you fail that program, there is no second chance for that. You only get a certain amount of time to do it, so you kind of just, it's like at your peril and things like that, so. But uh, they also, for, the, for those ones, like, for like a DUI or something like that, like a, or a motor vehicle charge, um, they give community service, but if you don't get it done by the time they say, they're, they're, they're taking that offer back, period, because they're, they're like, that's a gift to you, and if you don't take it, then you know, we have no time for you. Good. Thanks, Don. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. 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 I can't stand. I, no, I'm, I can talk to someone now. <laughs> like, this is yeah, too. You can talk to yourself. No. <laughs> I get the feeling he that probably does I was, that. Enough. I was this close. <laughs> Such a lightsaber. 
Yeah, they're too far away. <laughs> you can get up. Uh, I, now I know that I felt I was being watched. Yep. The whole time. <laughs> I was like, I was like, ah, oh, the silence is murdering me. <laughs> I'd like to get That's meditation at the end of the day. I, I'm just going to start going home. I'd like to be a silent. <laughs> now. What was your fourth casing? So nice not to be in Bristol. So nice. Went to Six Flags. So you left before 7 a.m. when the day started. Oh, I think I left Friday at 2.30. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, you weren't leaving until 4 p.m. Well, so. I mean, last, so last year my 